Hello, and welcome to the Daily Bread Bible Study. If you're unfamiliar with the Daily Bread Bible Study, this is the Bible study where we try and read the Bible together, and I give prompts for some feedback, for some conversation, and I look forward to being able to discuss anything that's here in our sacred scripture or anything that I discuss here on this Bible study. I want to make sure that you can access the Bible and um, access it on your time uh, using the resources that you have and be also feeling like you have community to be connected with. So I hope you enjoy this study. We are looking at day 72 for Thursday, March 12th, 2020, Judges chapters 1 through 3. So we are beginning with the book of Judges and we are looking back at the book of Joshua, which we just finished. It was devoted to the work of one Ephraimite leader there of the tribe of Ephraim named Joshua. And so after he dies, the 12 tribes go to their allotted portions designated in the book of Joshua. They're in the promised land of Canaan. In the book of Judges, it continues this narrative of the Israelites living in their allotted you know, sections of the promised land and especially the strong leaders who will judge in this area. So such leaders include stories about people named Deborah, Gideon, and Samson, along others. And this pattern of sending a deliverer will be picked up in the Messianic tradition, looking at the story of Jesus in the New Testament. So let's dive in. We've got a lot to discuss today in these three chapters here in Judges. In chapter 1, there is much work to be done. After successful battles led by Joshua, the Israelites have other nations to fight according to God's word spoken to Moses in Exodus 3, 8. I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up into the land of a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Again, God uh, wants no interaction with the people of the land. In Deuteronomy 7, 2, it says, When the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them and show them no mercy. In short, God wants the Israelites to drive out of the current inhabitants there in Canaan and the promised land should be holy for the Israelites and there should be no worship of other gods seen because if they leave up the people of the land, they might be tempted to worship their gods instead of the Lord God. We see that's where the beginning of the book of Judges starts, with that sin. The Israelites fail to evict the deplorable residents, and we see how interacting with these disposed residents will create headaches, idolatry, and even apostasy for the Israelites, none of which are good for what God wants for his people who he brought out of Egypt. Another note in Judges 1.16 it says, the descendants of Hobab, the Canaanite, also named Jethro, Jethro uh, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms, a.k.a. Jericho, into the wilderness of Judah, which lies near the Negeb, near Arad. And then they went and settled with the Amalekites. This is not good news for the Israelites because the Amalekites would attack the Israelites and Jethro, or Hobab as he's mentioned here, uh, Jethro, father-in-law of Moses, kind of bless each other and their descendants, instead of being blessings to one another, uh, join on different sides of the battle. So we see that... Uh, the Midianites and the Amalekites in Judges 6.3, they would rise up against the Israelites. And uh, we'll learn more about that story and the story of Gideon in Judges 6. But we see that conflict, uh, even with 
people that they have had relationships in the past that the conflicts and challenges are going to come in new ways here in the book of Judges. The tribes of Israel will not follow God's orders to remove the dispossessed inhabitants, and so that will be the main concern of which will lead to idolatry. It says, and the Benjamites did not drive out the Jebusites. The Manassites did not drive uh, out the inhabitants of Beth uh, Shaden, or Tanak, or Dor, or Iblium, or Migdo. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. Zebulon did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Echo or the inhabitants of Sidon, or of Abla, or Axib, or El Helba, or Aphek, or Rehob. You get the idea. Um, Naphtali didn't drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. And uh, the Danites couldn't drive out the Amorites. They failed in that sense because the Amorites pressed the Danites back into the hill country. The first chapter of Judges is all sorts of setup of the failure of the Israelites to drive out these people of the land, which is also a reminder of the failure to follow the Lord and to let the Lord be the one who drives out the peoples before them. But why is the Lord failing to drive out these people before them. Well, let's pick it up in Judges chapter 2 for a little bit more insight. Now, throughout their journey uh, from Egypt, the Israelites had made covenants with God, promising to worship God alone. Yet the Israelites have struggled to keep their end of this promise, even when enjoying the blessings of God. So God will let them know that God is disappointed and then uh, about their worship of other gods, and thus God, um, the book of Judges will involve the consequences along with this idolatry, and then what God does to redeem God's people, even in spite of themselves. So it's repeated here, the death of Joshua in chapter 2, and a new generation repeats old sins, not worshiping God alone. Thus in Judges 2.2, 2, God notices says, For your part, do not make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land. Tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my command. Here is the consequence that will be repeated time and time again in this book. Something that has been foreshadowed many times in the Old Testament, even with the grumbling of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness and choosing to make a golden calf instead of worshiping God. In Judges 2, 3, here's what's going to happen. God says, So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become adversaries to you, and their God shall be a snare to you. So there's the explanation. God is withholding God's ability to drive them out because they are choosing to worship other gods. In fact, God will do more in Judges 2, 14, saying, he sold them into the power of their enemies all around, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Yet God does not leave them hope, hopeless. In verse 16 it says, Then the Lord raised up judges, who delivered them out of the power of those who plundered them. Thus we get the name of the book. The judges, the people who will come and deliver them. And, uh, you know, and we will see that repeated over and over again. I should note that the perspective of this writer is pretty heavy. Its theology is different than mine because it says in Judges 3-4, they were, they were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their ancestors by Moses. The theology of the New Testament is different. It's that we as People keep failing in that God does something new by sending Jesus, uh, redeeming God's own people instead of depending upon them to turn to God. And, um, and it's all about the ways in which you know, God's grace shown there empower us to follow this God who is willing to love us 
um, even when we are stuck in sin. So that is a different perspective than what I have. But here, going back to Judges 3, we see the Israelites worship something called Baal, which the name translates to our word uh, owner. And so the idea is really about who owns you know, people's worship, right? Is it the Lord God Elohim who owns their worship, who gets their prayers, who they call upon in their times of need, who they look for for deliverance, or are they looking for something else? Are they looking to seek, you know, their own uh, pleasures? Do they forget about what the Lord God Elohim has done and the way that the ways in which this God brought them out of Egypt has blessed them with the land, has given them peace and prosperity, everything that they have, do they forget God? Well, that's essentially what happens. They forget God and turn to the Baals, the false owners, the false gods, as it would be. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, forgetting the Lord their God and worshiping the Baals and the Asherahs, which um, is another local religion, something about uh, trees and poles used for worship. Uh, we will see that they will be cut down in future times in the Old Testament. But the consequence of this worshiping of Baals and Asherahs, forgetting God, is that God gives them into the hand of King Kushan Risha Tha'im for 18 years. In the redemption after 18 years, God waits until 18 years later, they return to God and sends Othniel, brother of Caleb, to deliver them. And from his deliverance, the land has rest a poetic 40 years, just like they're wandering in the wilderness, 40 years of rest. It's a time of period, of uh, preparation. It's a common time. An amount length of time through which you know is the proverbial uh, season through which you can live in that um, sense and so these 40 years were a season of peace again in verse 12 they do what is evil in the sight of the Lord aka worshiping other gods and the consequence this time as God gives them into the hand of King Eglin of Moab for how long 18 years so it seems 18 years is very fitting. The redemption is that God waits until they return to God and sends Ehud, the Benjaminite, Benjaminite to deliver them. And he brings a tribute offering with uh, a representation of Israel, Israelites. They go and bring him and this tribute offering. And then Ehud... Um, goes back and um, brings a secret for the king. So in the imagery of King Eglin here of, um, of Moab and Ehud, they meet in a room which is a private room, which uh, for lack of better terms is what we would call a bathroom. You know, they had chamber pots, so there wasn't quite uh, quote unquote, a bathroom, uh, you know, space that we have with toilets. But, anyways, they uh, meet in this room where the king supposedly also relieves himself. And so then uh, Ehud, you know, comes and says, I have a secret, and pulls out a dagger and stabs King Ehud or Eglin there and uh, kills him and leaves the dagger in his body. And because he's so obese, the fat spills over and covers up even the hilt of the dagger so that he's just kind of hunched over. Uh, the, uh, you know, Eg Ehud escapes and um, Eglin's attendants kind of wait, thinking that, oh, I guess he finished his business there. Maybe he's just, you know, on his uh, uh, throne relieving himself uh, using the toilet for like a better way. Uh, Ehud, in the meantime, while they're just waiting and sitting around thinking the king is, you know, on the uh, toilet, Ehud gathers his troops and they go and attack the Moabites and kill them. 
And thus, this is how he delivers them, and the land has 80 years of deliverance. Really strange story, uh, but that is the story there. And for as much as they go into detail about Ehud's story, they just briefly mention the deliverance of another guy named Shamgar. In Judges 3.31, After him came Shamgar, son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad. He too delivered Israel. So these uh, Philistines, mighty warriors, Shamgar is able to overcome them. We will see a similar kind of feat done by Samson uh, you know, as he defeats the Philistines later as well. But there you have it. We have more conflict, more fighting. The conquest is basically designated, but the fighting will still continue with the people of the land. And so we will pick up more of this actions of the judges and get into more of the characters coming up next time. Thank you for joining us again for the Daily Bread Bible Study. Love to hear your feedback. Connect with me through Facebook. It's on, you know, these postings are on the Facebook Shepherd, uh, Shepherd King Facebook page. Uh, we're trying to make them available to people. Uh, we're using the group me chat to be able to discuss. I'm hoping to expand the offerings of what we can do a little bit. But thanks for joining me and Keep posted for more of the Daily Bread Bible Study.